So as we've been starting these uh, lately, I want to point out that um, at the county, uh, we care about the state budget uh, quite a lot for a number of reasons, and one of those is about a third of our budget comes from the state. And then when you combine it with the federal budget, it's more like half. A lot of the federal budget is passed through to the state, and a lot of it is matched to the state. So uh, we have a, a strong tie to the state and a lot of interest. And it's also true that um, the county is the safety net along with our community partners. Uh, half of our budget goes to public assistance and health care. And then when you include things like uh, child care and homeless programs from general government, uh, really all of the safety net programs are touched by the county. And uh, we take that responsibility very seriously. And the other thing is a lot of people in Alameda County depend on safety net services, more than 250,000. Uh, 17% of the county population are just in these five programs alone, CalWORKs, uh, in-home supportive services, Medi-Cal, CalFresh, general assistance. And as you can see on this chart, uh, these are the uh, six areas with the greatest <coughs> concentration on county service usage. That's uh, Cherry Land, Ashland, Hayward, Oakland, San Leandro, and San Lorenzo. So uh, that's some of the reason that we care about this. And now the question is, so how are we doing? And from some perspective, uh, you know, you hear the good times are here again. Uh, the economy is getting better. The era of state cuts has ended, and we're even hearing about state budget surplus. Schools are starting to get a little bit healthy because of revenue coming in and more localized funding. Minimum wage increase is going to go up to $9 an hour this year. Uh, unemployment rate is dropping. Um, so all of these things are uh, signs of things that are getting a little bit better. But then we don't want to lose sight of this. Um, over the last five years, uh, the state has cut $15 billion from safety net programs. And you can see on the far right here, these are um, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of county people are impacted by these budget cuts. Uh, these cuts have, for the most part, have not been restored. We're not seeing reinvestment. And so um, the issues for people are dependent on safety net services. Uh, things aren't getting better. In many cases, you're getting worse. So one way about talking about this is income inequality. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit more this year. This is becoming a big topic uh, locally in the state and at the federal level. So one way that we can talk about this is, as you see here, uh, top 1% of Americans in 2009 own a greater share of household wealth than the bottom 90%. And that was the highest disparity since the Great Depression. And then uh, the top 1% of Californians earn 33 times more than the middle class, average middle class in California. That doubled from 1987. So these are some of the examples of income inequality. Uh, and these, these are getting worse. This is a very interesting chart that I wanted to share with you. Um, it's actually an interactive chart that you can find on the New York Times website, but I wanted to pull out this particular piece. This is looking at after-tax income growth from 1980 to 2010, the United States, uh, Western European countries, and Canada. And there's a couple of things that are interesting about this. Uh, one is that the dark lines that you're seeing there, that's the United States. And uh, this is separated by 5% income levels. So you can see if you, as you look at those dark lines, uh, down at the 5 percentile, the 10 percentile, the lines are uh, relatively flat, even leaning down a little bit because uh, adjusted growth um, has uh, dropped a little bit or stayed flat since 1980. As you move up into the 90 percent and 95 percent, the far right, you see fairly uh, healthy, uh, strong growth for the United States. The other thing that I wanted to share about this as we're talking about in income inequality at the national level is that um, you know it's commonly said that Americans are the wealthiest people in the world. And partly what you want to see here is that it kind of depends where you're located. 
So, you know, down in the 5 and 10 percent, I don't know how well you could see the very light shaded lines. Those are countries that aren't the United States, Western Europe, and Canada. And you can see down there, there's actually quite a lot of countries where the average uh, income in the 5, 10, 20, 30, even into the 40 percent is above uh, the average income for Americans. It's really only to, as you get higher up, particularly into the 90, 95% area that you see that Americans kind of stand alone in terms of uh, wealth. Now the other thing about this um, is that you can also track growth. And if you're so inclined, if you want to go to the website and actually look at all these countries, you're, you're very welcome to do that New York Times website. This is called uh, the Luxembourg Income Study. And um, what you see is that uh, you can also see the um, extent of growth in all these other countries as well. So what we're starting to see is really up even into the 60 and 70 percentile that other countries are starting to catch the United States in terms of um, overall income. So that gives you a sense of the national level in terms of income inequality. And now I wanted to compare the United States to California and Alameda County just as a point of reference here because we're really concerned with the state and local issues. So you can see there where the arrow is, that's the United States. This is a formula called the Gini Ratio. And this is the, uh, the typical formula that's used to measure uh, relative income equality and inequality. Uh, a, a rate of zero would be perfect equality at a rate of one would be perfect inequality. Uh, nobody hits either of those levels, but just as a terms of uh, ratios. So you can see here that the United States is actually much lower than California and Alameda County in terms of income inequality. And I can uh, provide more detail on that if anybody's interested, but I want basically just to show the chart. So here's another way of looking at this. Um, this is the counties of the Bay Area. And what this data is looking at is the top 20% of incomes in each county compared to the bottom 20% of incomes in each county. And again, all of this is relative. So it's probably not surprising to people to see that San Francisco has the greatest income inequality among counties in the Bay Area. The, the top 20% is more than six times greater than the bottom 20% in San Francisco. Um, Alameda County is actually second at 5.5 times higher the top 20% compared to the bottom 20%. A uh, large part of the reason for that is that Alameda County has many more low-income people, and low-income is at a, a much greater, a more intense level than in other communities like Marin, for example. The bottom 20% is up in the 30,000s. So that gives us kind of a framework for income inequality, and all of this is a conversation really about poverty. And um, as we look at this chart, I want to say a little bit about poverty because you'll hear different numbers about poverty these days. We're starting to hear more accurate, uh, more precise numbers about poverty. Everything that I use is federal poverty levels. And those aren't necessarily the most accurate po poverty measures. The reason that I use federal poverty levels is because I'm looking across time, uh, often across decades, and we don't have uh, the same um, uh, the current levels of poverty like the California poverty measure. We really can't measure that across decades. So you'll see that here, but you might hear other speakers talking about other poverty levels, and I want you to keep that in mind. What I wanted people to see here is on the left, you can see California poverty rate um, over the decades from 1970 that it's been rising and a little bit more of a snapshot in Alameda County, not quite as extreme, but also continuing to go up. Um, drilling down a little bit, child poverty in Alameda County, as Supervisor Chan has said, there's 57 neighborhoods in Alameda County where childhood poverty exceeds 30%. Um, another way of looking at poverty is uh, families and female-led families. Families overall in Alameda County, the poverty level is uh, 14%, which is pretty much typical for everybody in Alameda County. But when you talk about female-led families, it goes up to 25% or one in four. 
when you talk about African American women head of household, it goes up to one in three. Another way of looking at poverty, uh, slides is elder poverty. This really applies to elders and uh, people with disabilities. This is looking at um, a grant called SSI, SSP. SSI is the federal grant. SSP is the state portion of that. Uh, back around 2008, uh, the state, as part of the budget cuts, decided to eliminate the COLA for this grant. And this is important because for people who get SSI, SSP, they're not eligible for a lot of other benefits, like CalFresh housing program. And so people really need to live on this amount. And what you can see on this chart is uh, today, the maximum grant is $877. If we continued the COLA, it would be $1,038 a month. Uh, the federal poverty level is $973 a month. And a studio apartment in Alameda County is $1,000 a month. So um, in order to live on this, it's a bit challenging at $877 a month. So now I'd like to move into uh, employment a little bit, talk about this for a moment, and particularly I wanted to focus on long-term unemployment. This is a, a big issue because uh, unemployment, people have been out of work for at least six months. Since 2007, this number has grown uh, by uh, three times, and, and the numbers are getting um, higher and higher. Now this chart, which looks a little bit busy, uh, this comes through the Brookings Institute and an a economist named Alan Kruger, who also uh, was with the White House for a little while. And what you can see here is he was looking at people who have been out of work for at least 27 weeks and what happens to them after 15 weeks. And what he found is that, um, I'm sorry, I said 15 weeks, 15 months, 64% of them never get back into the workforce after that period of time. Now, 36% of them get back into the workforce in some way, but only 11% back into the workforce in a full-time, ongoing basis. Everybody else, part-time or occasional work. So this becomes a really big issue when you think, so what is happening to people when unemployment benefits expire? And just to break this down a little bit, what we can see in the United States just, just last in March, uh, 300,000 people who had been out of work for at least six months left the job market completely. And that was the highest number since before the Great Recession. California and Alameda County, we look at the numbers a little bit differently. But here you can see uh, between 2011 and 2013, 643,000 people in California all of their unemployment benefits expire. Now, when their unemployment benefits expire, we don't know what happened to them. We, we just don't know. But they're no longer collecting unemployment benefits. In Alameda County, during that period of time, over 38,000 people ran out of all their benefits. And as most of you know here, um, recently, uh, the long-term benefits were completely eliminated. So basically, what we're going to find is these numbers are likely to increase, although we don't know that for a fact yet. So when people leave the, um, the workforce, um, it starts to look a little bit like this. This is called the participation rate. And what participation rate, for those of you who don't know what this means, is the number of work-age people who are either working or currently looking for work. So when you stop looking for work, you're no longer participating in the workforce. And if you look at this chart on the left, you can see right around 2008 or so, the number just starts to plummet. And this is people who are just leaving the workforce. And these are also starting to be at historically low levels. I just did a little snapshot for Alameda County. And you can see 2009, the number's a little over 71%, which is much better than the national number. But it plummets in 2010, and it continues to drop. Another way I look at employment is wages. And uh, what's interesting here is uh, these numbers are a little bit old, but you can see from 1947 to 1972, during a 25 year period, wages increased, adjusted wages increased by a little over 75%. So 
So that's about 3% a year that wages increased. Uh, since 1972, wages have increased by a total of 4%. So um, adjusted wages have really flattened out a bit. Now, we don't have the current numbers for this, but what I can tell you is that the Department of, of uh, Labor uh, recently reported that over 50% of new jobs are in low-wage sectors. And just yesterday in the uh, state uh, may, may revise, we heard that most of the uh, jobs that are coming, uh, new jobs, in the state are in low wage sectors. So the last thing I want to say about income is to take a little quick look at income and education. This is in Alameda County. It's probably not shocking to people to see that the more uh, education you have, generally the higher your wages are. But what may be a little bit shocking to people is the difference. High school, it's a little more than 31,000. Uh, graduate degree or college degree, it's, it's over 60,000. Again, these are really at historic levels. In 1965, uh, somebody with a high school degree made about 85% of what somebody with a college degree made. Now, it's not surprising to most people that most of the new jobs, uh, high-paid jobs, require a college degree or at least an AA degree. But one of the issues that we're really wrestling with is the cost of college and that um, the debt college debt for students has increased by 500% over the last 20 years. So not everybody can really afford uh, to play in this game. On the national level and on the local level, uh, people who are uh, needing food, that number continues to go up. And again, not surprising as um, all these other issues are taking place, people needing food is going up. Um, some of the um, activities that have taken place on the, on the national level have actually made this harder, and we appreciate what happened at the state level yesterday. Still not a, enough, and people I'm sure will still be, uh, will be talking about this in the next few minutes, so I won't go into any detail about this. Um, I, I also I wanted to share a couple more slides before uh, I move to other speakers. Uh, this slide is interesting. It's a little bit old, but I thought this was really important to show uh, a connection between poverty, hunger, and educational achievement here in Alameda County. This is looking at the different districts in Alameda uh, County. This is um, scoring that, um, it had, it, this has been changed, um, the base scoring in Alameda County, but this was the base score that was taking place in 2011. And really what you were looking for here was uh, a score of 800 was, was what every school district wanted to achieve at a minimum level. If you did better than 800, you're doing great. If you're doing below 800, you needed to do better. If you look at the um, chart on the left side, you can see all the districts that were below 800 on the API score had uh, free and reduced lunch needs of uh, about 50% or much higher. On the right side, you see all the school districts that do 800 or better on the API score, and all of those places, all of those districts, much lower than 50%, couple of districts there at 40 and 33%, but mostly much lower. So you can see a direct connection here. And the final um, slide I want to leave you with, uh, this is something um, that I really just came across recently, I'm embarrassed to say, because this has been out for a little while. This comes from everyone home. And this looks at the hidden homeless count. And this um, helps answer the question of you know, what happens to people when they lose benefits, when things get harder for them. Uh, unfortunately, this count is only done every six years. So we won't see this again until 2015, assuming we have the funding in place to actually do it in 2015. But uh, this is looking at people uh, who are couch surfing, who are about to lose their house, in danger of losing their house. It's a certain cri criteria that was being used. This is a hidden homeless count. And what you can see between 2003 and then as, as the Great Recession was really hitting is that uh, the number of people in the Alameda County hidden homeless count went up by uh, three times. And so this is just one of those things that we really don't know what's happening to people, but this gives us a little bit of a clue. So um, if people want to learn more about uh, the Human Impact Project, of course you can go to the website.